Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you in this place for everything, Lord God, that you have deposited into us these last several days. We say thank you for the rich fellowship and friendships, Lord God, that we are making. God, my prayer is that when we leave to go back to our assigned places of ministry, we would go back, Lord God, more improved, better equipped to serve you, Lord God and to bring you great honor, praise, and glory. Now, Father, I do pray that the seed of your word would fall on good ground, that it would take root, that it would bear much fruit. As the old African-American pastors used to say, God, stand in my body, think with my mind, speak with my tongue, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. And we'll be quick to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. One more time, if you've been blessed, would you give God a hand clap of praise for all that he's done? You may be seated. You may be seated. If I could have someone bring me like a music stand or some kind of podium or something uh, to be able to, uh, to rest, to rest my, my Bible on here. It is good to see you. I bring you greetings from the Bay where the 49ers are playing in the Super Bowl. So we, we rebuke that spirit, brother, in the name of Jesus. We, we pray God's favor among his chosen ones. <laughs> what an honor it is to be here with you. If you've got your Bibles, please meet me in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, I, um, I got on the plane to come here and uh, was thinking I was just going to come and encourage some leaders and had something nice and inspirational. Uh, and then I checked my notes that my assistant had given me about this trip, and uh, the notes had a specific set of instructions that you all wanted me to talk to you about the subject of diversity and unity. So I need you to understand, um, while this is on my heart, I, I, I didn't want to be a guest in your house and this be the first impression. I'm just following orders. I also need you to understand this is not angry black man time. I ain't mad at nobody. Uh, one of my staff uh, guys, a white guy, asked me, Brian, if you could live at any time in world history, when would it be? I said, as a black man? Now. <laughs> like, <laughs> 1753 wasn't good for me. 1853 wasn't good for me. 1953 wasn't. Now, we still have a lot of work to do, um, but I'm not mad at anybody. I own a home in the Bay, so I'm not mad at anybody. So I, I want you to, I say that a bit tongue in cheek, but I, I, I do need you to understand uh, that I'm not coming here to beat anybody up. There is some work to do, and I want to I wanna dive into this. Ephesians chapter 2, pick me up in verse 1. It's good to see uh, ministry legends like Pastor Jenkins and so many others, my good friend Bobby Manning, uh, grace to you and the pastor of this church. Paul writes, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. If I was preaching this back in the 90s, I'd call this little lesson naughty by nature. Y'all, I don't know if that would work in this room, like the rest of mankind. But God, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Love that. The Greek word for workmanship, poema, from which we get the English word poem from. We are created on purpose and for a purpose. Your mom and daddy may not have planned on you being here. 
And one of the ways you know that is if your closest sibling is a decade older than you, you was a surprise. But in the economy of God, there are no surprises. On purpose, for a purpose, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. And now, now let me just stop right here and say this. We, of course, believe that the words of Scripture are inspired. Amen? The words of Scripture are inspired. The little chapter breaks with the descriptions are wonderful organizational tools, but those are not inspired. So many of us, in our Bibles, there's a little break between verses 10 and 11. Mine says, one in Christ. So it's trying to organize something. The problem here is, that is breaking the flow of thought. So I want you to understand, verses 1 through 10 are connected to verse 11. And you don't have to spend a day in seminary to figure this out. Because the first word here, verse 11, therefore, which Paul is telling us, what I'm about to say is hooked into what I've just said. Do not forget that. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has, here it is, broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, pay attention to this phrase, one new man. In place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, there's a verse that I think every adult child should be able to quote to their parents. Whenever I'm around my father, Dr. Crawford Loritz, I always quote this verse. It's Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. <laughs> Whenever I'm around my dad, I always quote that. And I always ask him the question, now, Dad, are you a good man? True story, not too long ago, we were sitting at um, the Cheesecake Factory on the north side of town in Atlanta, right near where he lives, and I, I'm quoting tongue-in-cheek, Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves inheritance to his children's children. And my dad goes, funny you should bring that up, true story, I've just made some changes to the will. <laughs> my ears perked up, and I said, pray tell, what changes did you make? He says, here I am, we're in the state of Georgia, I sit down with my lawyer, and my lawyer says, Dr. Loritz, uh, I see that you have four kids, three are biological, one is adopted, I'm so glad to go through this editing process, this amending process of your will, but before we get started, you need to understand that Georgia state law stipulates that at any given moment, you can amend out of your will your biological children, but Georgia state law also stipulates that at no given moment can you ever amend out of your will your adopted child. That child is secure. This blesses me because when we come to the book of Ephesians, Paul starts out in chapter 1 by saying, when you and I got saved, we were adopted into the family of God. Now, with my 21st century American ears, I forgive me, I, I never do cartwheels over that. Because for me, my misunderstanding is that adoption somehow, some way, is second-class citizenship. When in the canon of Scripture, adoption is not second-class, but it is first-class security. That is why, right on the heels of that, he says, not only were you adopted, but you were sealed with the precious Holy Spirit. 
I don't have time to chase this because I got 24 minutes and 50, 49, 48 seconds to preach. While this is a multi-ethnic gathering, I know it ain't no chocolate person who came up with the idea to put a clock on the preacher. But anyways, I'm not offended. Don't, don't tell me that. Don't, don't tell me to take my time. When you got saved, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. I don't have time to chase this, but the idea of the sealing of the Spirit, it was a play on what the emperor would do. Whenever he would send some certified mail, he'd take his insignia ring, dip, dip it in hot wax, and make an impression into that document. And when you saw the king's insignia on that document, it, it served notice that this was authentic. When you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, you're authentic. You bear God's image, bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. We're the ones who are real. But, but not only that, it, it, would, it, it would be a statement of that you're secure. As we are saved, adopted into the family of God, Jesus is clear. No one can remove us from the Father's hands, not even ourselves. We have been adopted. Now chapter 2 is an exposition on this. What does the family of God look like? What does that process of adoption look like? He begins in verses 1 through 3 by, by talking about the glorious gospel, but before he can get to the good news of the gospel, he's got to give us the bad news of our sin. He wants us to understand that, that we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked. Uh, when I first met my wife here, she had just gotten saved at a church I was serving at, Bishop Kenneth Ulmer's church down the road in Inglewood, and my wife had just gotten saved, and when I first saw her, I felt compelled of the Lord to be a part of her spiritual formation plan. <laughs> and so I fall in love with her. I was a student at Talbot, and I was Poe. Not poor, Poe. I couldn't afford the other O and the R. I was, I was Poe. Fell in love with her, and um, uh, some months later, I just felt led of the Lord, this is the one. And so I went to the Diamond District, downtown L.A., and, and, and just I would walk into jewelry stores and would give them the specs to the diamond I was looking at and ask if they had a layaway plan. And, and I noticed when I gave them the specs to the diamonds I was looking for, they would never take these diamonds and just put it on the glass counter. They would always roll out a black velvet cloth first and then put the diamonds against the backdrop of that black velvet cloth, and it would cause them to sparkle a lot brighter. In Ephesians 2, Paul is giving us the diamond of the gospel, but he puts it in verses 1 through 3 against the black velvet cloth of our sins. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. He goes on to say that we were, by nature, children of wrath. I get this all the time. Some non-Christian would ask me, what, what are you talking about? I thought God loved me, but this is saying he's angry with me. How can love and anger coexist? I said, easy. Do you have kids? Because <laughs> can't nobody tick us off like the ones we love? Anger is not the opposite of love. In fact, you only get angry over what you care about. God's love for us runs so deep and is so profound that he's angered by our sin. Sin, he says, is not just something we do. It's, it's who we are. We are by nature. My friend Tom Schrader once said, if, if sin were blue, we'd all be Smurfs. It colors everything about who we are. It's not just our activity. It's, it's our nature. And then he says, but God. Boy, if I was in a different context, cue the Hammond B3 organ. But, but God. In the midst of all of our rebellion, in the midst of our deadness, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of us thumbing our nose at God, God came running after us through his own son, Jesus Christ. And he says, it is by grace. Not by the letters behind your name, not by your social network, not by your parents' pedigree. It is by grace you have been saved. My friend Matt Chandler says grace essentially means you didn't eat your dinner, 
but you still get dessert. <laughs> By grace, we have been saved. I went to school up the road here, uh, Pastor Jenkins at, um, at Talbot School of Theology. My pastor, Bishop Ulmer, who you know, um, got me into that school. But again, I was Poe. So I received something called the SIRS Scholarship, S-U-R-R-S. Talbot, and I'm on the board, back then was wrestling with these issues of racial reconciliation and diversity. And they were looking at, what does it look like for us to right these wrongs? So they came up with this scholarship for underserved and resourced and represented students. And I got that scholarship, which means, essentially, I got a scholarship for something I had no control over. I got a scholarship because I'm black. Now, this pains me to tell you this. And some of you don't like this. What's easy for me to say is, hey, I got a 4.0 in Bible college, and I got this merit-based scholarship that got me in. If, if I only agreed to continue the 4.0, that scholarship would be kept up. That's the boasting. Merit-based scholarships are the boasting. And if you're frustrated that I got a scholarship not for my merits, but for something I had no control over, then you need to be frustrated with God. Because in the kingdom of God, there are no merit-based scholarship. You got in and are kept in because of his grace. It is grace that saved you and grace that keeps you. We are saved by grace through faith. Every Friday night is family night in my house. One of the games we play is Monopoly. It doesn't give me any greater joy than to just destroy my children <laughs> in Monopoly. I love bankrupting these little jokers, getting all these houses and hotels and just bankrupting them. But you know one thing I never do at the end of Monopoly? I never grab all my money and make a run for Bank of America. Why? Because while Monopoly money has value within the realm of Monopoly, it means nothing in the kingdom of this world. Again, you, the letters behind your name, the fact that you pastor a church, your pedigree, your social network, that might carry cachet in the kingdom of this world. But in the kingdom of God, it means nothing. The only currency that matters is we are saved by grace through faith. So now we get to the end of Verse 10 of chapter 2. And need I remind us, this is not the end of Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, watch it now, is all about vertical reconciliation. It is what God, through Christ, has done for us. But Paul ain't done. Now that he's talked about vertical reconciliation, he now moves to the subject of horizontal reconciliation and a specific kind of horizontal reconciliation that reaches across the ethnic divide. Yeah. Now, I don't mean no harm, but I want you to see what Paul is doing. He is talking about the issue of race. You don't need to play games with the text. You don't need to get cute with your scholarship. He says in verse 11, watch it now, therefore remember that at one time, watch it now, you Gentiles, and now he doesn't just say Gentiles, but he says you Gentiles, watch it, in the flesh. Which means he is now going to connect the gospel to issues of racial injustice. I don't know if you signed that statement that was floating around. This whole idea that the gospel is not into social justice. And I know social justice has been politicized, just like evangelical has been politicized. But if by social justice do you mean caring for people who are marginalized, reaching across the aisle and walking with folk who don't look like us, act like us, think like us, or vote like us, if that's what you mean, then I would say for sure the gospel is into social justice. In fact, the Bible knows nothing of a gospel that is content to sit in church and hear finely manicured homiletical masterpieces while people in the streets 
are hungry, while there's improper imbalance in education, while people are being overlooked, Jesus knows nothing about that kind of gospel. So the call here is to be Ephesians 2 Christians. And not just Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 Christians, but Ephesians 2 that canvasses all 22 verses of it to preach a gospel that is both vertical and horizontal. To get our arms around this, we must go back to Paul. Romans 1.16, Paul says these words, and I know we quote them evangelistically as well we should, but I need you to hear them sociologically, where he talks about, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe, not to the Jew only, but to the Jew first and also the Greek. This now becomes Paul's missiological methodology. Whenever Paul walks into a town, trace it out in Acts, to plant a church, he always asks two questions. Question number one, where's the synagogue? I want to hang out with the Jews and preach Christ to the Jews. So in Acts 17, he walks into the synagogue and unfolds the scroll and preaches to them. But he's not done. He now, after leaving the synagogue, says, now where do the Gentiles hang out? Acts 17, they point up to Mars Hill. Acts 19, they point him to the hall of Tyrannus. This is his pattern. He then goes to Mars Hill and he preaches Christ and some Gentiles get saved. Now he's got a problem. Now he's got two groups of people who have just been vertically reconciled to God through Christ by grace, but they hate each other. So what does he do? Had he gone to some of our academic institutions, some of our seminaries in the mid to late 20th century, he might have subscribed to something called the homogeneous unit principle, which in effect says birds of a feather flock together, which functionally said do what's pragmatic. Find your demographic, cater to your demographic, preach to that demographic, don't mix demographics, and cater to that crowd. And if for some reason the neighbor start, neighborhood starts to change, move out of the neighborhood. Or plan a different campus on the other side of town. This would have been expedient and pragmatic, but unfortunately it's unbiblical. Paul says, now that you Jew and Gentile have come to faith in Jesus Christ, now that you claim to be reconciled by God through Christ, I am starting multiple campuses, I ain't starting multiple churches. I'm going to start one church in this city and call that church to be the theater by in which you play out what you supposedly said happened to you vertically by doing life with people horizontally who are different than you. That's the call. So that legitimately... When you walked into a church in the first century world, the norm was multi-ethnic diversity. This is not something new. We've just veered so far off the course that we've neglected our call. Now, I'm not here to say every church should be multi-ethnic. I believe that when you plant a church, God gives you a passion for that community. God gives you a passion for that city. And your church should reflect that community. Dr. Corey Edwards, the great Jesus-loving sociologist at Ohio State University, says the problem is, in the year 2020, the average community that a church sits in is 10 times more diverse than the church, and the average schools in that community that the church sits in is 20 times more diverse than the church. Yet again, it's the church of Jesus Christ lagging woefully behind. The great tragedy of the church of Jesus Christ today is we're not wowing the world. So you can literally drive down the church, drive down the street and go, that's the Fox News church. That's the MSNBC church. That's the CNN church. That's the rich church. That's the poor church. That's the black church. That's the Hispanic church. That's the Asian church. That's the white church. We're just as segregated. Paul says that when Jesus Christ died, the cross served as a sledgehammer, dismantling the dividing wall of hostility. I love this. 
Here now, Paul pulls us into a poignant New Testament image. It is an image of the temple. If you've ever been to the temple, if you've ever read up on the temple, I should say, you should understand that the temple is made up of four courts. The outermost court is the court of the Gentiles, then the court of women, then the court of Israelites, then the court of priests. Dividing each court is a wall of partition. In fact, I believe that in Matthew 21, when Jesus walked into the temple, And he cleansed the temple. Do you know where they had set up their wares to sell their devices? In the court of Gentiles. I think Jesus is not just angered by the gross commercialization of his father's house. I think he is actually also responding to racism. These Jewish leaders said, we will sell our wares in the only place the Gentiles can worship. And who cares? They shouldn't be here in the first place. In the 1870s, archaeologists actually found writing on that wall that says something to the effect of proceed no further upon fear of death. Paul says, On the cross, Jesus Christ has dismantled the dividing wall of hostility. Now that that wall is gone, it is a poignant image that Jew and Gentile can now rush in together and do life with one another. And yet if there's something the church of Jesus Christ in America has done well at from day one, It is resurrecting what God has already dismantled. We get an A-plus for that. The late 1700s, a black man had the audacity to pray in the whites-only section of a church in Philadelphia. They didn't even let him finish praying. They picked him up off of his knees and threw him out in the street. This began a mass exodus of African Americans from that church. Two weeks later, they they bought a blacksmith's shop and thus began the African Methodist Episcopal Church. In fact, if you just trace historically most African American denominations, we started because the white church failed to be the church. Had the white church been the church, the black church may not have ever existed. Now's our moment in time. What will you do with your moment? The dividing wall of hostility has been broken down, he says, so that Christ may create in himself one new man. I love this. Paul is writing in a language called Greek. And there's several Greek words he could have used for new. One is the Greek word neos. Neos speaks of something that is new as it relates to time. It's the 2020 Ford Expedition. It's the latest MacBook Pro. It's it's the latest 777 jet to come off the Boeing assembly line. That's neos, something that is new as it relates to time. Paul doesn't use that. He uses the Greek word kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S, K-A-I-N-O-S. N-O-S. Kainos doesn't speak of something new as it relates to time. It speaks of something new as it relates to kind. It is the idea of invention. It's something so new, you have no category for it. And he uses that word in the context of the coming together of Jew and Gentile in this thing called the local church. Neos is the latest MacBook Pro. Kynos is the first computer ever created. Neos is the latest uh, Ford Expedition. Kynos is, is the Model T. Neos is the latest 777 jet to come off the assembly line. But Kynos, can you imagine standing on the beaches of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, looking up into the sky at the Wright brothers and trying to describe that? Mind blown. Paul says that's what the church should be about. 
people walk in. Going, what, what is this rich and poor man sitting next to each other about? Or people walk in going, why are Bloods and Crips hanging out together? Where people walk in and they're seeing ethnicities doing life with one another. I got to ask you, is your church blowing people's minds? What are they saying? Typical. I enjoy mayonnaise. Not Miracle Whip, mayonnaise. <laughs> mayonnaise is, uh, I've studied this thing pretty thoroughly. <laughs> Manny, mayonnaise is a bit of a chemical anomaly. Have you ever thought about this? No? <laughs> it's got stuff together that shouldn't be together, like oil and water. These two entities are polar opposites. They don't like each other. So how does oil and water hang out in close community in this thing called mayonnaise? Well, if you got anything of a chemistry background, you know how this works. Mayonnaise also has something called an emulsifier. An emulsifier is something that, that brings different things together in close community. In mayonnaise, it's the egg. It's as if the egg says, oil, I know you don't like water, and water, I know you don't like oil, but, but come here, oil, plug into me. Come here, water, plug into me. And as I become the focus, I'm going to bring stuff into your path you would have never imagined hanging out with. <laughs> On the cross, Jesus became our emulsifier. There's black folk and white folk and bloods and crips and Asians and Latinos. He says, make me the focus. There's a reason why in the scheme of things, verses 1 through 10 come first. Make vertical reconciliation the priority, but when that's the priority, you keep following me and I'll put things and people and places in your path. When Christ is lifted up, I will draw all people unto me. And when I'm being lifted up and when I'm drawing, now you'll start doing life with people who don't look like, act like, think like, or vote like you because the gospel is taking root and it's changing lives. Oh, that we would be that kind of people. In the name of Jesus, let me pray for us. So, Father, we thank you. Satan has done a number on this nation. Our historic sin is racism. But we declare today, Lord God, that greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. Oh God, we do pray for Ephesians 2 churches. We do pray, Lord God, for Revelation 5, Revelation 7 churches where John said, I looked up into heaven and I saw people from every nation, tribe, and tongue worshiping the Father. And Jesus, when you taught us to pray, you taught us to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Long Beach as it is in heaven. In Mountain View as it is in heaven. In Baltimore as it is in heaven. In Orlando as it is in heaven. Father, would you give us the courage to move in these directions? Would you give us the love patience, the endurance to run this marathon race, Lord Jesus. Would you strengthen us? Would you encourage us, Lord God? Yeah, Lord God, there's going to be moments of frustration. The enemy doesn't like this. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. White folk ain't the enemy. Black folk ain't the enemy. No human being is the enemy. That's just the clothing sometimes the enemy wears. May we walk in our divine authority. And may you do it in our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.